and welcome to Clean Texas June webinar, The Growing Power of the Grid Edge, How Vendors and Customers are, increase, are Increasingly, Easy for Me to Say, Interacting to Shape the Future Grid. And first of all, I'd like to thank Hush Blackwell for once again uh, hosting this. And they got a great team that have helped us out and they have wonderful software and their contributions are truly appreciated. So today, what we're going to be talking about are these distributed energy resources that are now popping up all across the country. And we know that Texas isn't overseen by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, but nonetheless, it's kind of interesting that in the fall of 2020, when the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission passed FERC Order 2222, which told all the other grid operators that they needed to set up operating models to allow distributed energy resources to participate in wholesale markets like any other asset. At that time, Chairman Neil Chatterjee commented, DERs can hide in plain sight in our homes, businesses, and communities across the nation, but their power is mighty. How much so? Well, some studies, he said, have projected the United States will see 65 gigawatts of DER capacity come online over the next four years, while others have even projected upwards in excess of 380 gigawatts. So, you know, whether it's 65 or 380 gigawatts, it's pretty immaterial. It's gonna be a lot. The number's huge. So today to talk about this and how we can realize that potential, how this will get done, we have two experts to help guide us. We have Vijay Bettanabatla, Director of Industry Solutions at Autogrid, and Shankar Achanta, VP of Products at Sonova Energy Corporation. And so what I'd love to do is have each one of you, starting with you, VJ, introduce yourself, give us a little bit of background about what you do, some of the history you bring to this, and then tell us in a minute or two, you know, how does this, what your background, how does it relate to the topic at hand? And just the, the thesis statement, if you will. Thanks, VJ. Absolutely. Thank you, Peter. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, VJ Betten Butler, uh, Director of Industry Solutions at AutoGrid. Um, I'm based here in Austin, Texas. So AutoGrid um, provides software solutions uh, to electric utilities and new energy companies, such as Sonoa and others, um, to manage DERs by aggregating and orchestrating them um, through our DERMS and VPP solutions. We serve over 40 global customers in 15 countries uh, across four different continents. And right now we manage close to six gigawatts or 6,000 megawatts of flexible capacity on our uh, platform. So AutoGrid uh, has been consistently recognized as the number one flexibility management uh, platform by independent evaluators, most recently by Guidehouse Insights. And uh, we were also recently acquired uh, by Schneider Electric. So I am uh, very excited to be part of this panel, um, looking forward to sharing how technology is enabling DERs to play an important role in fighting climate change and improving the, the reliability and resiliency of the grid. Thanks, and I'm not, gonna, let, yeah, I'm, go not gonna let, no, I'm not letting you off the hook quite yet, VJ. Okay. So as Director of Industry Solutions, what do you do in that role? Yep, so I work with customers to bring our solutions, as I mentioned, right, uh, DERMS and VPP, and we'll get into the uh, more details as we go through the presentation and the, and the discussion uh, to match those solutions with the use cases and the needs of customers. And as I mentioned earlier, our main customers are uh, utilities that are seeing an explosion of these DERs on their systems, as well as the, the new energy companies such as Sonoa and Sundra and others who are deploying these assets on the grid. How do we bring those the solutions and the needs together? And essentially um, convert what is seen as challenges right now into solutions. Okay, so you're kind of a matchmaker in that regard then. Yes, I am a solution architect. All yep. right, great, thank you so much. Now we'll turn it over to Shankar for, for a self-introduction. Thanks, Shankar. Yeah, thanks Peter, and thanks for having me on this, uh, on this panel, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Shankar Achanta, and I've been in the energy industry for over 20 years now, started my career uh, at a company called Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories, where I built a uh, hardware product system system solutions for power utilities, in the mainly in the distribution controls and sensor uh, side of things, so distribution level. 
Um, also worked on a lot of lot of products that were used by several utilities uh, in the timing and communication uh, areas, uh, hardware and system products. I joined Sonova about a year and a half ago to to lead a product development for the residential nanogrids and commercial and community microgrids. So this is really like uh, to evaluate, explore existing and emerging technologies and bring them into the fold of like homes and communities from a renewable energy and new energy technology standpoint. So what I do is I, I work with a lot of OEMs, uh, me and my team closely, and kind of understand, like translate the use cases into the requirements to them and they, they go in and take those requirements and develop products um, along with other inputs that they get, right? So I'm really excited to be here on this panel because I think, I think I'm going to talk about the building blocks that bring all these DERs together and uh, to, to scale and to, to create that mighty power that Peter, Peter talked about at the beginning. I do have 25 patents on my name. Uh, I'm blessed to work with a lot of smart people in the industry, developing new products and solutions for the energy space. Very passionate to drive things in this sector. Thank you. Thank you, Shankar, for joining us today. Um, often, as, as you all who've watched our, our webinars in the past or attended know, we often don't go with slides, but in this particular instance, in our preparation uh, conversation, we decided that a few might be helpful since talking about something, we often talk about wind and solar and batteries and that sort of thing. And now we're really moving to the other side of the meter, which is new across the entire industry uh, in some ways and listing all these assets and getting them to do things they've never done before. So uh, we thought we actually would bring a couple slides into this conversation. Um, can we, um, Vijay, can we talk to that first one, uh, which I'll, I can pop it up. There we go. Can you can you uh, give us a little bit of background, BJ, in terms of what we're talking about here and how we migrate from your traditional demand response into something which is much more dynamic than it used to be? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, right, uh, the the this area of flexibility management, what we're calling DERMs or VPP, virtual power plants, right? This this, this is new to the industry. It's also abstract. It's not as tangible as some of the other resources we, that we generally talk about in the renewable space, such as wind and solar, right? Uh, so I like to use this nested representation to, to uh, cover the full scope of flexibility management. So as you mentioned earlier, right, for Chairman Chatterjee, he famously uh, referred to DERs as small but mighty, right? Um, uh, traditionally, We've addressed the the we've been focusing on the small part, right? And now we are uh, starting to address the mighty part, and that's because we now have the technology, the business models, and the incentives to truly unleash the mighty potential of these small DERs, right? So as as I said, the this field is um, fast evolving with uh, new and exciting capabilities. So uh, this nested representation, starting with uh, the most familiar and the most basic, right? Demand response management system. Everybody is familiar with this. We've been uh, using this as a, um, uh, as a supply option for a while, right? To manage uh, grid emergencies and such. So if you think of your traditional uh, behavioral demand response, bring your own thermostats and more automated forms of demand response on the CNI side, et cetera, that is what a DRMS system does, demand response management system, right? But uh, the next level is the DERMS or the Distributed Energy Resource Management System. This is where customers are rapidly adding solar and storage fleets to the grid, um, uh, EVs and um, microgrids more recently, right? So compared to the, the demand response piece, which is mainly driven by the loads, um, most of those fall under the fire and forget, right? Event-based uh, model. Whereas the di distributed energy resources, right, the solar storage as well as uh, microgrids, EVs, they're much more 24 by 7 uh, assets. So it needs uh, advanced capabilities to to forecast, optimize, and dispatch these assets in real time, and that's what uh, the distributed uh, energy resource management system does. Still, both these uh, uh, solutions 
are mainly focusing on the grid needs, right? The next level of this is virtual power plants. This is where we take all these resources from behind the meter. We can, if we choose to, add them or aggregate them with larger assets, sometimes front of the meter, let's say utility scale or community scale, wind, solar storage, right? And then take these um, uh, assets to the wholesale markets to trade energy services, such as uh, capacity, energy, and ancillary services. And that is really the full scope of uh, virtual power plants. Uh, th there's, there's a few good platforms that are uh, fully capable of delivering this holistic solution, uh, AutoGrid being one of them, uh, right? Uh, and so the, if you look at the, the real world, though, right, these assets do not exist in bubbles. They're spread across the grid. And that's why you need the technology to aggregate and orchestrate these uh, these resources. So what you're seeing here, right, is uh, the foundation of any virtual power plant or any flexibility management uh, solution is the, the flexibility that the customers bring to the table. That is their loads and their DERs. So utilities and aggregators using software solutions such as AutoGrid can aggregate these resources up, right, uh, because the customers are bringing their flexibility to the to the table, they're getting paid for their participation. And these aggregations, they can be both uh, physical or logical aggregations, uh, depending on how you define these programs and how you control these assets. So what this uh, gives the utility is a new um, supply option that they can then use to either serve their own needs, such as uh, grid services, right? Peak, uh, peak demand management, network management, grid emergencies, et cetera, or take them to the market to provide ancillary services, uh, capacity and energy imbalance services. So um, that's a quick intro. I'm, I'm sure we'll get into a lot more details, right? I'll, I'll now hand it off uh, uh, to Shankar. Uh, so he'll talk about um, some of the building blocks of how to control, connect and control these DERs, and um, he'll, he'll get into the details there. Shankar, off to you. Yeah, thanks, Vijay. That was great, uh, uh, great overview. And what I would like to start with is that basic building block, which is the residential nano grid. Like Vijay mentioned, there's a lot of uh, activity happening behind the meter. Traditionally, when we when we looked at uh, when we think about distributed energy resources, it was thought as like some energy storage behind the meter, right? But there's there's a lot of emerging technologies, a lot of uh, a lot of new uh, systems being added behind the meter, um, all the way from, like, of course, the PV um, is is definitely a key uh, key item that's getting added uh, and it's growing. And there's a big load uh, that can be a load or storage, uh, which is the EV. Um, so that's getting um, getting to a point where it's it's uh, it it crossed the chasm and it's, it's taking off, right, electric vehicles. Interestingly enough, that technology is dual purpose. One, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, transportation for the customer, but also can be used as uh, a, a resource, a grid resource, or even backing up the home loads during an outage, right? So when you, when you start looking at these, uh, kind of to, to have these DERs participate in the grid service programs, you're kind of looking at the customer uh, for dual use cases, right? You're trying to enroll them, but at the same time, you're kind of a little bit of trade-off on their primary use case. In this case, it's like transportation or in, uh, in like if you take a thermostat, it's like the comfort. Like I, I want to set my thermostat at a certain temperature, but now if I enroll it, it we might move up and down, right? Electric vehicles is a big deal. And then you look at like controllable loads. Um, there's a lot of uh, activity happening in that space. And uh, to, to name a few, like electric heating, uh, like even HVACs uh, and, and heat pumps and uh, all, these, all these things are coming and becoming more modernized and electri I mean, electrified with controllable um, aspects to it. So uh, for, for my role, I mean, for, for what we do is it's, it's kind of like this assortment complexity behind the meter, if you will, right? 
So you have all these different disparate technologies uh, that are quote unquote uh, smart or can be controllable, can, uh, can have communication interfaces, but at the same time, depending on like the technology readiness level, these are not fully baked or fully, fully thought through. There are some of these things are still in the, in the stage where they're, they're rudimentary, right? I mean, they do the primary function, but when you talk about like control and, and telemetry and all of that, this is the constant, I mean, like discussions that, that, that we have as the asset owners in this space, in the new energy space uh, with our vendors, right? So looking at this picture here, I want to touch on that. So you look at the home, there's a lot of, lot of different uh, electrification happening inside the home, behind the meter. Uh, but at the same time, there's signals coming into the home, like the weather, the, the, the utility signals. The, this needs to be managed. The, the energy management needs to happen, right? And, and the trade-off is really the comfort, the resilience for the user, uh, because the grid can, I mean, you have grid outages, right? And at the same time, again, like participating uh, this fundamental building block into the DER programs or, or, or the programs that, that VJ touched on, right? So there's hardware. And then the next level is again, like as I said, the data APIs. So this is like, okay, what type of data does each asset have? Do they provide the, the application programming interfaces for to take in the signals, the, the, the telemetry and, the, and the, the control signals? And again, can they be remotely uh, managed uh, providing the customer experience? And this is interesting because a lot of these systems are, are, are still being communicated through home Wi-Fi network, right? And, and again, there's a variation there depending on how the installation happens from a hardware standpoint. Uh, these are getting to a scale, like there's a lot of uh, strong appetite to, to get these installed and, and move to the next one uh, for, from the installation companies. In that process, there might be some, some, some glitches, some roadblocks when you, when you look at, can you communicate with this asset behind the meter? So we see all of that, and it's important to, uh, as an industry to, to standardize some of these things, like, hey, always a certain asset will have an LTE uh, communication, not dependent on homeowner, uh, Wi-Fi password or, or, or the network, right? Uh, that's one thing that, that's, uh, that we're actively looking at, and when we engage with the, with the OEMs, we help them like define the, the use cases and the roadmap for them. Uh, Vijay talked about the grid services aspect and, and really the energy services at the tip of this is how do, you, how do you balance all of these, keeping the customer in mind behind the mirror, right? Like uh, if you're changing the setting in a battery, like what does that mean? Because you got a control signal from outside. What does that mean for the customer? Like we need to notify them, we need to let them know that, hey, this is the experience that you'll have and you're trading off a little bit of resilience or, or comfort or both in some cases in exchange for, of course, they're getting paid. And they, I mean, we're monetizing this from a business standpoint, uh, but yeah, that's the balancing act. Um, so hope that gives, uh, uh, add some color to, to what we're looking at at the building block level and the data level. Uh, and yeah, back to you, Peter. Great, thank you. Um, I appreciate the, the background. I have some questions percolating in my head, but I want to invite the audience uh, to start to type in questions and then I'll play traffic cop as we move through the conversation. If you're looking at those questions, we'll talk for another, say, 25 minutes or so, and then we'll roll into answering questions. But I have a couple right now. That, so first of all, I look at this home here uh, which is representative of a home with multiple devices that could be indeed addressed. And, and the first question I have, I, I think I'm going to pose this one to VJ is, back in that slide you had the first one where you start with DRs and then you move into the DERs. It seems to me that whole new population of DERs 
almost all of them seem to be bidirectional capable. That is, before that, DR was just turning stuff off, but it couldn't send power back to the grid. Is, is that an artificial distinction I'm making, or is it really a fundamental distinction that opens up the doors to DERs in ways that didn't exist before? It, it is definitely a fundamental shift in in how smart, well, uh, the types of devices that are being brought to the market, right? Storage has only taken off, especially in the residential space, um, uh, and even more so in the commercial industrial space, only in the last five years, right? Uh, and into the future, we're going to have a lot more EVs than we have on the uh, on the roads right now. Um, even as an industry, uh, it, when I say the industry, as a flexibility management industry, right? We're only dealing with um, what we call V1G, right? It's just managing the charging of these EVs right now. But quickly, uh, these OEMs will have to enable the V2G capabilities where the, the um, EVs that vehicle to grid. can inject. Yeah. Yeah, inject back into the grid. So that opens up a lot more opportunity to to use these resources and bring a lot of um, required services uh, to the grid. So uh, you're right in making the distinction that traditionally for the longest time, we were only using the, the loads as controllable, well, uh, controlling the loads, which is just turning them on or off to switching into a more 24 by seven operation of these uh, bi-directional uh, capable uh, devices. Thank you. And, um, and Shankar, you come from Schweitzer and Schweitzer is really well known for its um, oh, synchrophaser network capabilities and sensors and, and that sort of thing. And it strikes me that here we have the situation where in a very short period of time, we might have ISOs like ERCOT or in other states or or grid operators calling for a whole bunch of assets, potentially in the hundreds of megawatts, by definition, all on the distribution side of the grid, so at center point or Encore and so on, and these bi-directional flows that have never happened before. So what kind of intelligence do we need to infuse the distribution grid with in order to make sure that this is not only reliable, but that it's safe and that we have the voltage levels and the frequencies that we desire and we're not, in fact, creating new problems by trying to solve old ones. I know that's a loaded question, but what are your general thoughts around that? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great, uh, great question. So from a, from a distribution feeder standpoint, these, these automation schemes like you talked about, the, the synchrophasers are like, they're installed at strategic points throughout the feeder line to, to monitor the power flows, to, to, to give the V's and I's and, uh, all that data. Now, when you go to the behind the meter, like these assets, we we want to have like the voltages and currents and the and the power and the frequencies and the intervals that we uh, that we desire, like to talk about to unlock those applications that you're talking about. And 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 interestingly enough, like when you look at this, I talked about the assortment complexity, right? I mean, there's multiple OEMs building the same kind of product and you, you send a control signal to change the setting on a battery, one render takes 15 minutes to, to, to do that. The other render does it in one second, right? I mean, there's that. Uh, so there has to be some kind of convergence on and standardization on to, to unlock and make this more uh, seamless and scale it without, uh, I mean, without any glitches. I mean, still, there's a lot of work to be done, but that's uh, that's where I see it. You know, your, yeah. your response there reminds me of what the Federal Highway uh, Administration is trying to do with its new uh, rules around interoperability of EV chargers and so on, like trying to set similar rules of the road for everybody. And this is and a, a question came up uh, right away. Are there issues with accessing data? So not only the speed with which responses, but how about data and proprietary software from various vendors? Is, is it a Tower of Babel out there or are there already common frameworks for communication? It is, It is. Uh, I would say it depends on the vendor um, and, and some are more open, some are not. Like usually uh, it, the, the data is, is a sticking point. 
I mean, I'll be I'll be transparent, right? It's a sticking point. Hey, the asset is is there. It's producing the data, and like the telemetry is one thing, but a control signal going in and manipulating the behavior of the of the asset that's a little bit more uh, sticky point for 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 some some vendors. And the other thing is, where is this data housed? I mean, like like what servers? like the cybersecurity aspect. I mean, we're dealing with customer data here, right? And where, where it's going before before it gets to where it needs to go. Uh, those are all the things that need to be need to be addressed and they're like actively being worked on. I mean, it, it's a it, it's a big deal. Thank you, yeah, DJ. Uh, I think I, I think I cut you off before, so please please join no, in. No, not at all. Uh, this is an important uh, topic for us. <laughs> Hence, I tried to jump in, but. Uh, um, uh, Shankar is right, right? There, there, there are certain OEMs that, that are more uh, protective of their information, right? Data is one thing, data of the customer, yeah, we need, we all need to be extremely careful in how we protect it. There's measures that uh, software platforms uh, take to do that. Um, but then uh, interoperability is a whole different matter and that's, that's where our stance uh, regarding interoperability is that hardware OEMs should not restrict uh, the controllability of these devices, right? Uh, to, to their own proprietary uh, software solutions. They need to open it up for the benefit of the utilities, of the customers uh, and themselves, the OEMs themselves, right? The more uh, value that the customers can extract out of these uh, devices, the more devices that the OEMs are able to sell. So it definitely benefits them. Um, so in that regard, we see um, a little bit anti-competitive uh, behavior from OEMs, from certain OEMs in, in defending their information, not opening up their uh, APIs to other software platforms. Yeah, that's kind of typical. Yeah, go ahead. Vijay, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, I think, I think this is like a, a, a battle between like standardization and proprietary um, uh, systems, right? Coming yep. from the uh, serving the primary utilities, uh, for the, there's always there's always like companies want to have proprietary solution and lock out other vendors, right, and build a moat. Uh, yep. But also like from uh, looking from the other side, interoperability makes it so much easier from an operation standpoint. Just to just to run the business, just to qualify stuff, just to get things moving. Um, I think it, there's a balance uh, between uh, having proprietary uh, systems versus interoperability. But without interoperability, it and with the proliferation of these technologies, it becomes uh, difficult and complex to manage these assets. Yeah, uh, we, we are at a scale right now where we need to figure all of these things out before uh, we go from the, the thousands or the tens of thousands of devices into the hundreds of thousands of devices, millions of devices in the future, right? Um, so, uh, like I said, uh, our stance, we, we are a founding member of OpenADR. Uh, we are still a board member, Autogrid is, and um, uh, we strongly support open standards uh, or opening up uh, OEM APIs for uh, other vendor platforms to, to be able to connect and control their devices. You know, it's interesting. You have the slide up before that showed uh, potential creation of value and value stacking. So potential creation of value for distribution utilities and then other value for the grid operators. And in some instances, one might actually run into conflicting objectives. And it's fascinating to me. So for example, California, when they rolled out storage initially, the Public Utilities Commission came up with 12 rules and established a hierarchy. And the, the main rule of the thou shalt or thou, thou shalt not was, if the resource was devoted to grid adequacy, a resource adequacy, you know, reliability, it could not have compromised itself, for example, by, mm, arbitraging, buying power when it was cheap and then having sold it, right? When the grid calls for it, oh, sorry, we sold all of our energy or we already activated our DERs. What's the state of thinking of EJ around establishing hierarchy values and, and 
rules that are going to be critically important to make sure that when this does expand to become mighty, it's doing the right things. What's the what's the state of play? I mean, you're talking to different utilities, grid operators. What's that conversation like right now? So uh, the, it's true that there is a risk of uh, double counting right now, right? Double dipping into uh, different programs. If we are talking about even from a FERC 2222 uh, standpoint, if if they're saying uh, the the operators should allow for these DERs to participate in wholesale and retail programs, there, there's a direct conflict there, whether we are uh, using the same resources, double counting on each side, right? Uh, this is definitely being addressed even for 2222. Uh, it recommends uh, the, the operators and the utilities to, to come up with tariffs that, that have a clear delineation of how to minimize uh, the potential for double counting, right? Uh, from uh, even the software uh, solutions themselves, they uh, can bring that intelligence in that when we look at uh, the various value streams that we can access, we are, uh, by, by nature, we are optimizing these different value streams, right? That is another uh, area where we, we, as the software platform that has all the visibility, can bring that intelligence and, and, and avoid some of those uh, uh, potential mistakes. Thanks. And does that... Um... Does that standardization that may be necessary, so a hierarchy and then some of that interoperability, does that extend down to the home energy management system or or can it be, say, upstream of that where different vendors have the ability to control that space, but after that level, the information needs to be normalized? How does that potentially play out? I think it's a combination of the home energy management system where it has the intelligence of all the, the resources that, uh, or the assets that you have in uh, different uh, states of, uh, let's say a battery, which uh, what is the state of charge? What are the different programs that it, it, it can participate in along with the software uh, platform themselves, right? It's a combination of those two that uh, need to work well together uh, with clear, um, standards that are coming from the utilities uh, that is going to solve that problem. I, I, I think it's definitely a challenge and that needs to be worked on some more. Thank you. Shankar, um, not only Sonova, but others in the space like Sunrun and SunPower started off as solar companies and then migrated into batteries. And then you see the Generax of the world moving into batteries and you see the end phases moving into the storage space. Um, so now you pretty soon have combinations of solar and storage. Um, how far, how much additional work does it take in terms of the software and the capabilities of an organization to then start reaching into, and we're already seeing some companies with electric vehicles to get into the vehicles and then the air conditioning and the water heaters and all those other things. What level of computational capability is required to essentially orchestrate the entire home and then take that house and tie it into a whole bunch of others to deliver what the grid operator or the utility is asking for? I mean, that sounds like just an enormous IT and artificial intelligence play. How would you characterize it and how far along are we on that road to say perfect power? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great point. And we constantly look at that. There's this again, like the assortment of different technologies behind the meter, and and each one of them are at different technology readiness level when it comes to data access, control, telemetry. So it's it's moving forward. But what the way we see it is there has to be that cohesive customer experience at, at the home, right, at the residential nano grid. And balancing that, tying all these assortment of devices together into a cohesive experience and balancing that with like other services that the home can provide, like the grid services and the things that we've talked about is is a nut that needs to be cracked. I mean, that's the, the that's the that's where like the industry is going to move. And as we get into more and more advanced devices, 
the way I see it is really like a local control needs to needs to exist. It, it cannot be completely remote uh, because first and foremost, the, 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 the comfort and the safety of the homeowner is important. So there has to be some local algorithms running at the home. And then like you have the remote uh, control and telemetry uh, signals coming in at different uh, intervals and whatnot. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of players who are getting into this space, like you mentioned. And the way I look at it from my vantage point is really uh, like they're good at certain things, and they're and they're far ahead in certain things, but they're just starting in in some other uh, technologies. So it, 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 that's where like it, it's. It, it will evolve into the best of all these technologies into a home uh, that provides the best experience for the customer uh, along with the resiliency and, and unlocking the value of that whole nano grid for other services that we're talking about. So yeah. one, one thing about the nano grid, so you basically are talking about a home in this picture here where it can essentially island off from the grid. Grid goes down, there's still batteries, rooftop solar, electric vehicle so it is its own little microgrid in your in your future world is that is that what you're all building towards at sonova that's that's the yeah i mean these are all grid type systems uh yeah and and they can island and uh, grid form i mean the inverters the smart inverters like grid follow and grid form when there's an outage and then once there's an outage of course like how you manage the load within uh what modes of operation i mean there's a whole new technology load management within the home um, it, it, that, that comes into play. How do you extend uh, the, uh, how do you ride through that outage for the longest amount of time with the minimal amount of uh, on-site storage? Um, mm -hmm. Systematically uh, shedding loads. This is not like at the scale at which, like at the speeds at which it happens on the distribution level, uh, load shedding because of some anomalies and whatnot, but definitely, uh, I mean, that technology is there. Um, one other question. So if we migrate out from the home to that planning and operational environment. So again, you've got maybe one of the ISOs, could be ERCOT, calling for all this virtual power plant capability. And now this information, this, the, the data, and, and so data's got to flow and energy's got to flow. How do you make sure that ERCOT, who's asking for this stuff, knows what's happening and that the distribution utility knows what's happening on its system? Because that's where the resources are residing here. And then also the vendor. I've heard some people suggest that perhaps what we need to do at some point in the near future is just to create some kind of universal registry, the same way we have IP addresses in an internet, so that everybody knows, you know, each, each device potentially has a unique identifier, like we have for a social security or computer has with an IP address. And then the what, the where, if it's an EV, we also can note that it can move, the how much, the how long, all those characteristics or attributes are assigned to that. What's the what's the state of thought around that sort of registry type of a concept out there right now? I've heard it bandied about a lot in recent recent months. Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting approach, and I I, I want I mean it's the, it's the concept of like IEC sixty one eight fifty where you you have identifiers for all these IEDs on the on the distribution side and the transmission side. It's similar yeah. concept. Uh, it, it, it is. It solves some problems for sure at scale. How can we do that? And and now um, how? Like first, I think we need to solve the communications aspect, right? Mm -hmm. Reliable communication to each of these assets. That's the first and foremost. And then the building block, like that. That is the fundamental, right? How it's how it's commissioned, how it's wired, how how the data is flowing, the comms medium needs to be figured out. 
Uh, I think a lot, of, a lot of companies are doing that, moving into that direction. When we talk to our vendors, we, we say we need LTE comps. I mean, like we need that like, because of the reasons that I mentioned before, right? And then on top of it, yeah, absolutely. Now you go into identifiers and kind of like registering them and, and kind of having a, a log of kind of like a syslog or like event log, what happened with this device? So we can go go through that. Like when an event happened, this is this is what happened with this device. It went offline or it was online. Uh, it was in this mode before the event. We changed the we changed the mode to this uh, because of a control signal. All that stuff can happen once we once we have a reliable communication and the identifier that you're talking about. DJ, any additional thoughts on that? Thank you, Shankar. Yeah, from um, so definitely seems like a. <laughs> I, I don't know if we will have that kind of um, solution anytime in the the near future, right? Um, so, from if you think about ERCOT from their perspective, right, uh, what matters is they know w with a certain certainty that they're going to get the response that they need. And whoever yeah. has the financial obligation to bring that uh, and serve that need, as long as they have the confidence in the solution that they're adopting, that should be that should be okay, right? I'll give a couple of examples. Um, right now, we uh, uh, CPS Energy is one of our uh, largest customers. We uh, they use our platform to manage 240 megawatts of their flexible capacity on our uh, system. Uh, part of which is also providing ERS to ERCOT, right? Uh, and that's the, that's working okay. And we we provide similar services across the country. So, um, and this is kind of tied to one of the questions that com that's coming through the chat too, right? So, uh, Sunrun and Sonova, both of them use our uh, software platform as their VPP platform. Sunrun manages uh, two different programs, I think one in PJM and one in uh, California ISO, uh, to provide resource adequacy by aggregating their residential um, solar storage, right? So the, the aggregations are happening and are working uh, well. In terms of uh, connectivity, um, yes, there are some challenges. So uh, given that the main medium that uh, we use to control these devices is Wi-Fi, it, there can be some challenges. It's not actually the customer Wi-Fi that is that is the problem. It's the uh, the gateway device that it, that um, controls or, or connects to the internet, right? If um, and some OEMs are better than the others. Uh, for instance, Sonova uses Tesla uh, batteries, and that is the best uh, devices for us in terms of connectivity. So we rarely have any issues. Uh, if you uh, dial it back to some of the smaller devices, such as um, smart thermostats, water heaters, those kinds of things in the residential space, they are a little bit more spotty. Even with that, we get 80%, 85% uh, response, which is pretty good across a uh, diversified um, uh, assets, right? So um, we know uh, with, certain, uh, with a certain level of uh, confidence that we are going to get 80% of response from these devices. And, and as you move into the ba uh, batteries on the residential side, it, it's pushing the, the high 90s, right? And then if you go into the CNI space, since we use SCADA protocols uh, for that and with redundant communication channels, et cetera, we we have much more confidence, close to 100% response from uh, the, the CNI assets. As an aggregation of all of these things, right? Uh, uh, Shankar talked about all these different smart devices that are being introduced into the homes and the businesses. It's the perfect mix to give you the, the right level of risk diversification in terms of technology, in terms of uh, uh, geographies where they are uh, deployed, Right, and, and hence the, the emphasis on mixed asset uh, VPPs. So mm -hmm. you, you, can, you can overlay the, the, the strengths of different, uh, all these different assets and get the right level of confidence and controllability for these assets using that diversification. Excellent, thank you. Um, 
you mentioned if it's CPS that's originating. Okay, that I, I get because because they're originating with devices in their own territory. What about if it's ERCOT that's reaching across to assets in Encore and Encore doesn't know about it? And the reason I ask is when 2222, when they when FERC was asking for comments, APPA and the National Association of Regulatory Utilities Commissioners, those folks who are representing what's happening at that level, they pushed back pretty strenuously saying, wait, this is this should be under our domain. Now you're putting the compensation activation of that into the wholesale market domain. Now, obviously, ERCOT is not, you know, subject to FERC jurisdiction, but the same sorts of models begin to emerge. So how do you make sure in a situation like that, where the originator of the signal is coming from the ISO, that the distribution operators know what the heck's going on on the grid that they're supposed to safely and effectively and reliably manage? Yeah, that, that exact dynamic is playing out right now as we speak here in ERCOT. Um, Tesla recently held a workshop um, and showed the results of a demonstration that they did. And they, in fact, they were able to aggregate 64 of their uh, residential batteries, power walls, and respond to SCED signal from ERCOT, a, a simulated SCED signal from ERCOT uh, regulation, four seconds, right? Uh, and then uh, I believe RRS and non-spin signals. So they, they can do it all and they proved it, except we, we now have to work on the rules to allow these kinds of aggregated resources to fully participate in all of these different services that we just talked about and monetize yeah. uh, those services. So the capability, the technology is there. It's been proven as recently as last month, right? The yeah. results are out there for the public to see. It's for all the different stakeholders to, to come together and say, this is the right direction for the industry to go. Whether or not there's objections, that is where the industry is headed, right? How do we minimize the friction, uh, address, put, uh, and, some of the, the objections but that are being put up by ERCOT uh, as well as Encore or whoever the, the, the T&D company is, they're very reasonable, right? They're asking about what ha if, you're, you, if you have a distributed asset that's uh, spread across a, a zone, right? What happens to the intrazonal congestion? How do mm -hmm. I have visibility into it? It's a good yeah. question. Right. Yeah. Uh, we we as stakeholders need to work together. If if the aggregation of DERs and the supply option that they bring to the market is a net positive to the industry, we need to work together to overcome whatever reasonable barriers there are. Uh, there's right. always technology solutions for everything. For instance, we recently. Um, uh, demonstrated at uh, Distributech um, uh, auto grid integrated with the uh, Schneider Electric ADMS system. So we, as AutoGrid, have visibility and control to behind the meter assets, right? The ADMS systems, they have the network intelligence. They are the network model-based solutions. They can see all the way up to the meter. So by putting these two solutions together and working together, uh, we can deploy what's called dynamic operating envelopes, in essence, to address the exact same concern, the intrazonal congestion, or even uh, the distribution level issues that these uh, resources can potentially cause by saying, okay, the ADMS is looking at the system, has the, we are providing the intelligence from behind the meter based on everything that they see, here's the limits that need to be applied to each site. And the, uh, the, the VPP solutions can then honor those constraints when they optimize their, uh, the, the different assets within a site uh, to, to avoid causing uh, problems on the system. So then it would be fair to say, uh, both Jankar and Vijay, that right now we have the technical capability for those aggregated DERs to operate efficiently and be able to participate in something like, for example, ERCOT's ancillary services market, similar to how other assets operate. It's, so that technical capability, well, yes, we got some more work to do on the communications, but it's coming together and really now it starts to come down to what are the operating and business models that 
will inform the decisions that are made from a societal and market basis. Does that kind of sum up where the whole thing moves? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, I think that's a that's a fair summary, Peter. I mean, uh, as with anything, the the more the number of actors, the the whole I mean, the complexity increases, like to in decision making and whatnot. Um, I think the technology is there and it's rapidly evolving uh, in this space, and uh, it's it's prime time to 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 get onto this and kind of shape this and and unlock these these values that we're talking about with these assets. And then, does it matter? Um, so I've heard in some instances, you know, five G is going to be a major enabler. What's the? And there's a question here. Uh, a number four, uh, fourth question, which says, how readily acceptable and adoptable would it be for reliable communications to be provided by standalone solar power, solar power fitted with 4G modems or Wi-Fi? Like, what, what, how does the whole communications infrastructure roll out and what's the minimum that's needed in order for us to have the latencies that are critical to provide the necessary grid functions. How fast does that stuff have to move and what's the communications infrastructure that's necessary to make it happen? Yeah, I think 5G uh, offers a lot of uh, um, lot of promises and capabilities. Uh, and there's also other technologies uh, that are mesh type networks that you can use, um, aggregating the information at a hub um, behind the meter and, and kind of sending that over um, like cellular communication, 5G or uh, LTE, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, the latencies for, for residential, uh, it's not like like protection speeds that you see in the in the distribution or I mean like distribution level. Uh, it's in the order. I mean the the, the fastest we've seen is like a second uh, type stuff, but the streaming uh, streaming aspect of the data. And the data storage, that's like you, you might need a bigger pipe for that. Um, and, and I think we can solve that. Uh, it's just, it's just having, having the OEMs like add these or make it a priority to their roadmaps to, to, to unlock the data and give the access and, and give the right communication interfaces. I think, I think what, what I'm seeing is yeah, like anything else in product development, right? I mean, you have a certain set of features that you want to develop. They go into a <laughs> into a spreadsheet or whatnot based on the resources, and then and then the things that get prioritized get launched first, and then the rest of the stuff. This is not like a high priority for for at least it feels like for a lot of folks. I mean, they want to get like a customer app first and a product, and and the pace at which this industry is moving get the product out there, right, start selling, and then and then add these other things that were, that were getting requested. That's how I see it, at least, uh, at least the newcomers and, and on newer products. Absolutely. Um, the, the, the latencies that we see right now, they're more tactical or operational than technical. Right, it, it, it's, okay. the, it's the services that we are able to monetize right now and what is the latency that is acceptable uh, for those services, right? It, we can always speed things up. The, the technology is there. Um, we need to work with the OEMs um, and that's going to remove that barrier. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, the latency is definitely application specific, absolutely. Okay, I'm going to illustrate my next question with three numbers. The first one, uh, 5%. That's the most recent uh, percentage of electric vehicle sales relative to total overall sales in the United States. It's in the high teens in places like Europe and, in fact, 80s in Norway. But here, 5%, still 1 out of 20, not bad. Second number, 201. In May, Ford delivered its first 201 F-150 Lightnings. Those things are vehicle to grid capable. The small one has 98 kilowatt hours and the larger one has 131 kWh in it. And then the last number I'll throw out is $4,200. Last year, a Nissan Leaf in Burrowville, Rhode Island, the sewage treatment plant, participated in a demand response program 
and essentially fed energy from the battery into the facility of reducing the demand from the grid for that sewage treatment facility. So growth in vehicles, bi-directional capability compensation now starting to show up with the 4,200 number being extreme, I recognize. Where do you think we're going to be with, within, say, five years in terms of that electric vehicle ecosystem in this country and the ability for vehicles to first charge at the right times and provide grid services, and then second, actually start to provide valuable bi-directional feeds. What, what does that potentially look like, uh, Shankar? Yeah, so the EV, of course, it's, it's going to take off. Um, so I think uh, one in every three buyers will buy an EV. And then the interesting thing is, the attach rate for someone who's buying an EV with installing solar panels is going to be like one to one. Uh, I mean, that's how I predict uh, because like you, you, you have increased the load of your home by, mm -hmm. by 50% or more. Where else can you get that extra energy there to, to power your vehicle? Solar power, I mean, it makes sense where, where it's applicable, right? So we see that connection for sure. Um, and then the whole vehicle to grid and vehicle to home, the way I see it is first the vehicle to home will, will be the first one that will take off. Mm -hmm. And then the vehicle to grid, it's not about technology, the vehicle to grid, a lot of, again, a lot of factors, a lot of uh, interconnection requirements, a lot of regulations, all those standards, everything needs to come together. So I see that progression as vehicle to home first and then vehicle to grid. Um, now, uh, what was your third question again? I'm sorry. You know, just like where do you ultimately, where do you see this playing out? How big an ecosystem could this be taken to fruition? Yeah, yeah. And, and EVs will become a major asset uh, from, from the DER standpoint. There's no doubt about it. Um, I think, uh, do I see them replacing uh, stationary storage? No. The stationary storage will still exist and it will complement the, the, the storage on wheels, if you will. Uh, they play well with each other. Uh, that's, where, that's, the, that's where I see the future uh, going into um, from my standpoint. Thank you. Uh, so Vijay, it looks like we've got this massive constellation of new devices, software that's now being informed by artificial intelligence that, that can take more complex problems and solve them, the fundamental communications piece, all these things that you're working on at your level and Shankar is working on at Sonova. Uh, is this the most exciting place to be in the grid uh, in the next leading question, but next decade, is this the place to be? Absolutely. Absolutely. They, uh, I'm not saying because I'm here, but <laughs> I'm here because it is the most exciting place to be, right? Uh, and it uh, ties into your question to Shankar about EVs themselves, right? EVs, uh, both V1G to start with and V2G especially, they're the biggest challenge as well as the opportunity that our industry uh, is looking at in the next five to 10 years. Potentially, if every house has an EV or two, Right, and hundreds of uh, uh, EVs on on fleets. Uh, let's say Amazon, FedExes, etc. Right, these are batteries on wheels, and they're very predictable in that they're used at certain times. They're connected. Potentially, you can have them connected all the time to access uh, the the vast amount of storage in those batteries. Right. So, how we address this as an industry. Um, determines how well we will manage this. Will, will this become a challenge, right? It can potentially burn down every theater in the country or uh, it, it will help in fighting climate change and uh, kind of pushing off some of the grid investments uh, and uh, contribute to lower costs for, I mean, these are customers deploying their own capital. It's it's prudent of the industry to, to make, make maximum uh, use of the capital that the customers are are, are deploying by uh, by their own choice. Thank you. Well, look look at this. It's already uh, almost uh, right at the turn of the hour, and uh, 
But I'd, I'd love to have you all back a year from now and see where we where we are and what the two of you and your respective teams have accomplished. It is without a doubt a very exciting and dynamic space. And I thank you both uh, for having contributed to the dialogue. And once again, thanks to Hush Blackwell for hosting the event. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, Peter. Thank you, bye. Bye.